Hello and welcome to State of the Economy. Today we have with us a special guest, Kiran Majumdar Shaw, a founder and chairman of Biocon Limited, uh, one of India's leading biotechnology, uh, biopharmaceutical companies. Uh, uh, much more than that, she is a self-made entrepreneur. And uh, well before uh, people really talked about startups, uh, back in 1978, she started uh, this firm out of a garage and some 10,000 rupees. Uh, and, uh, and then build this company uh, into one of the leading biotech companies. So uh, she's with us today. We'll talk about a lot of things out besides her company and what she does uh, in her space, uh, because she's also a, a big spokesperson for, for reforms uh, and governance-related uh, issues. Uh, welcome to our show, uh, uh, Kiran Majumdar Shah. So, uh, so tell us, you've been of late been talking a lot about governance and reforms uh, leading to inclusive growth, uh, which is the buzzword uh, uh, now for some years. Uh, and this government, when it came to power in 2014, uh, a lot of businesses, you included, expressed a lot of hope uh, that something new will happen. Uh, a new India, as it were, as Prime Minister Modi talks about, is getting created. And, uh, and digital India, was a very, very uh, a strong driver of uh, this new India that people are talking about. You have a lot of uh, thoughts on uh, digital India as, as, a, as a primary driver of inclusive growth. Just tell us about your ideas around this. So, you know, uh, personally, I believe that digital India is a leapfrogging, game-changing agenda for India, okay? And uh, if you think about uh, inclusive growth and inclusive development, it's about connecting every Indian to the marketplace. Now, today it's impossible to connect every Indian to the marketplace uh, by building physical infrastructure, but by uh, focusing on building, uh, you know, internet superhighways and, uh, you know, network, uh, or networks of internet connectivity, I think you can actually connect every Indian to a virtual marketplace. And that's what the digital economy can do for a country like India. You know, Are you happy with the way it's progressing? Well, I think you know, there's not that much uh, to brag about because you know, we are ranked 114th out of 189 countries in terms of internet uh, speed. Internet speed. Mm -hmm. And I think when you look at uh, the fact that we have a huge mobile teledensity in the country, you know, mm -hmm. over a billion users. But then if you look at the penetration of smartphones in rural India, I understand it's less than 10%. Yeah. So okay. if you look at some of the statistics, uh, you know, we have daunting challenges. But the fact is, this is a huge opportunity for India. And if we can deliver on it, this is game changing. This is transformational. So when you talk about transforming India, you can only do it through embracing new technologies mm -hmm. and then leapfrogging uh, ourselves out of a very, very archaic, uh, uh, you know, uh, systems. Uh, so I personally believe that you can do a lot with this. And um, the government needs to really focus on leveraging uh, you know, uh, IT in every possible way. For instance, everyone talks about fiber optics as the only way of kind of connecting the people. Yeah. But I think today the satellite technologies are actually helping us uh, to, to, to again leapfrog out of the fiber optics uh, physical it's infrastructure. It's a combination of both. And not just that. Remember, India's space research, uh, uh, you know, ISRO has just shown to us that we have you know, uh, created a world record by launching, uh, you yeah. know, uh, 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 over a yeah. hundred satellites. Yeah. Now, satellite technology today is driving connectivity in a big way. Can we basically innovate mm -hmm. our future based on, uh, yeah, you India know, is surely among the, at least among the countries, a dozen countries who are ahead in this uh, space. Absolutely. But no, what I'm talking about is to connect the dots. That connect is, you know, dots, yeah. uh, link the satellite technologies that we have with our internet uh, needs mm -hmm. and really create this internet backbone for India mm -hmm. uh, in terms of a high-speed connectivity using okay. all these technologies. These sure. are all about multiplexing technologies. Kiran, I want to, uh, Kiran, uh, nobody will quarrel with whatever you've said so far. No, it, it is something, it's a no-brainer. But there is some confusion in our country, uh, partly deriving from policy or largely deriving from policy, as to what should the government do 
and what should the pri private sector and, and civil society and individuals do? Uh, now, the government has taken a huge initiative, uh, Startup India initiative. They want to fund startups also, although so far I've not, uh, uh, reports are that, that given all the conditions that they're imposing on, uh, on, distribu uh, on uh, disbursing startup funds, hardly any uh, firms have or individuals have come forward to, uh, you know, to uh, take money, government money for startups. And the other thing is, uh, digital India, in the context of digital India, the, the biggest piece uh, from the government side is connecting some 250,000 village panchayats uh, through optics fiber and then f public services and then uh, creating applications at, at those levels to, to provide services to the people. Now, how important is this? You know, like here the private sector also comes in because yeah. they are the ones who build software, etc. Right? So, so, you know, one of the biggest challenges and I think one of the biggest flaws of mm. our governance structure is that we have never basically had alignment mm. between government policy, mm -hmm. regulators and the stakeholders. It's a continuing problem. So, it's we need... there for the last 15, So, unless they are aligned on a mission mode, mm. you are not going to move the needle. That is my view. Okay. So, I really believe that in every one of these uh, strategic intents, mm -hmm. I think we need to bring these three uh, on an aligned path. Okay. So I think what you just so how mentioned... how do you propose that? So what, what you just mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, if you work in silos, the government is only interested in a certain, uh, you know, application of, say, uh, internet uh, connectivity. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, uh, other stakeholders like the citizen, the businessman, the academician has a very different use for internet connectivity. Yeah. And the regulators look at it with a very different lens. Yeah. So I think you need to bring this alignment by first setting your objectives. Okay. And, I, and I think I've seen that uh, very successfully done in mm. many of the realms that I have engaged with government, okay. where we've actually worked with the policy makers, the regulators, yeah. and the stakeholders, which in this case was industry. industry. But, you know, stakeholders doesn't have to be just the industry. You need to actually also get the citizens involved. Mm -hmm. You need to get maybe the academicians involved, the farmer involved. You know, there's so mm -hmm. many stakeholders depending on what you're trying to do. Okay. So when you're looking at inclusive growth, mm -hmm. if, you're, if it's just about a bunch of... Uh, you know, policy makers and regulators trying to solve that problem, you are not going to succeed. And that's where most of our problems are. So do you start with a customer or what? The consumers? No, I think you need to have all three on the table. Yeah. And that's how it works best. If you first state your objectives. So if you want inclusive development through digital technologies, mm -hmm. what is your objective? So if you actually state your objectives very clear mm -hmm. that it is about a virtual marketplace that is accessible to every Indian, mm -hmm. then you will look at it that way, you will formulate policies in that way, mm -hmm. you will regulate accordingly, mm -hmm. and you will also make sure that all the key stakeholders who want this access to that mm -hmm. that that uh, you know the internet okay. uh, will 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 uh, be provided what with what they need to do, okay. and I think that's where you need it because otherwise what happens like e-commerce is mm -hmm. what we are talking about. I mean okay. this is what we are really talking about sure. at the end of of the day is e-commerce. Creating an Alibaba in India. No, it's not mm. just that. It's mm. e-commerce for every sector, every you sector, know, yeah. whether it's agriculture, whether sure. it's uh, consumable, consumer products, whether it is anything, you know, pharmaceuticals. And in a broad sense, connecting even fragmented producers with fragmented consumers. That's what I mean. That, that is the, that's that the is power the break, of the internet. The breakthrough that you need today, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's the power of the internet. Mm -hmm. So if you identify that as your main objective, mm -hmm. then your e-commerce policy will actually reflect all of that. But today, we have a confused policy which is being rolled out by a set of policy makers who see it with a very narrow lens. They don't really understand the, the complexities of this particular business environment. Okay. So you need to bring in e-commerce uh, stakeholders, you know, mm -hmm. people who are familiar with what e-commerce is all about, mm -hmm. and also bring on board people who are not familiar with e-commerce mm -hmm. and allay their concerns, and then create a policy that Are you that suggesting can... that there should be a fundamental shift in the way policy is formulated? Absolutely. And uh, Absolutely. there should be lateral entry into 
uh, there should be committees where uh, all stakeholders should be present uh, to decide policy. Well, you know, it, it is a sensible way of doing it. I mean, I know that in our own biotech sector, we always do that. You know, for instance, any policy that we are now coming out with, mm -hmm. uh, the Department of Biotechnology uh, invites mm. yeah. an industry body, which is the Association of Biotech-led Enterprises. It invites uh, the regulatory agencies. Okay. And it invites also the academic uh, members uh, whom it chooses to invite, depending on what the subject is. Okay. And we did a great job coming out with a biosimilars guideline because we were all aligned on the objective. And the main objective was safe, efficacious, high quality biosimilars mm -hmm. that can provide affordable access to these, you know, like important insulin, drugs. Cetera, right? Yes, mm -hmm. important drugs. Mm -hmm. And we also wanted the guidelines to make sure that these products are brought to the market in, an, in a short span of time so that the abbreviated pathway, uh, whilst it is abbreviated, still makes sure that it looks at efficacy, safety and quality. So I think once we stated those objectives, it was very easy for us to all align so you're guidelines. saying that this model could be followed in uh, in other sectors too? Is that what you It can be followed everywhere. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think by not including, again you're talking about inclusiveness. So inclusiveness mm -hmm. in reforms and regulatory uh, and policy matters is also very important. Mm -hmm. If you exclude the main stakeholders out of policy making or regulations, mm -hmm. you are not going to come up with optimal policies and regulations. That's the way I look at so it. So do you, do you feel that we still have a tendency to to make big announcements, uh, like grab headlines, you know, Digital India, Startup India, Stand Up India, uh, and and we don't, when I say we, the government, various stakeholders, they not necessarily look at the details of policy or details of uh, how things would work out on the ground. Is, is there a, uh, would you say that that's a, that's a gap in the way we do things in India? So yeah. let me answer that question by saying that there is a very good intent behind all this great rhetoric mm -hmm. and these great, uh, you know, uh, slogans, slogans yeah. you might call it. Mm -hmm. But I think the bigger challenge we have is that many of these areas have multiple uh, agencies all sort of wanting to grab center stage. Okay. So let's look at, um, say for instance, uh, our own sector of pharmaceuticals or biotech, okay? Mm -hmm. We have to deal with multiple ministries. Okay. Now, each ministry has its own pulls and pushes, and and they tend to kind of. But we promised a small government. Yes, <laughs> and that governance. is, I think, and I think there's a problem there. When we talk about maximum governance and minimum government, mm -hmm. we have a huge opportunity in terms of regulatory reforms. Mm -hmm. And if you look at every one of these sectors, whether it is digital India, whether it is biotechnology, whether it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the, the any other sector that you look at, you know, mm -hmm. you will find that there are multiple ministries and multiple agencies involved mm -hmm. in deciding and making policies for these sectors. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can simplify it by really making one nodal agency that can think about certain things, mm -hmm. that would be the most ideal. Mm -hmm. But even if you can have a governance model of who takes what call, call. That is not clear. Right. And I think that's where we have our problem so of not translating our great ideas into action. So would you say that, you know, when this government came to power, these promises were also uh, made, G minimum government, maximum governance, leaner government. So there was a, a kind of expectation that, that there would be a break from the past. Uh, you know, UP also had so many ministries. Then slowly, this government also seemed to have ended up with large number of ministers, ministries. Uh, so, so do you see any substantive change in the way things are being done? Uh, or, or Well, frankly, I don't see such a huge change in the way things are being done because mm. simply because we are not simplifying things, okay? Simplifying. We are not, uh, you know, sort of reducing the, the uh, you know, the sort of the bureaucratic hurdles in terms of getting things done. So Look, you we are talking the bureaucracy about... is still uh, like hanging heavy on the... 
uh, on the marketplace? Only or? because of the structure that we are saddled with, okay? Mm -hmm. I think we need to break these structures. And until we break these structures, you're not going to find great change. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why when you talk about ease of doing business, mm -hmm. we are still very poorly ranked in terms of uh, the global index. Mm -hmm. But having said that, yes, when you talk to certain parts of the government, there is a sincere and positive intent to change things. Yeah. For instance, when we, when I talk to Niti Aayog, I'm very, very hopeful that things will happen. Mm -hmm. But then I go and talk to the individual uh, ministries and then my heart uh, sinks because yeah. I know that they are not ready for it. Okay, yeah, yeah. So that's the complexity of what it's all about. So mm -hmm. I think uh, the Modi government is very uh, committed to this reform mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. But I think they haven't envisaged the complexity mm -hmm both the bureaucratic quagmire mm. and the kind of governance structure that they are saddled with. You know, this is a legacy issue. Yeah. Which, so unless they break the present system, they disrupt the present, uh, mm -hmm. you know, bureaucratic and governance structures, you are not going to see huge But change. some might argue that there are disruptions happening, like demonetization is disruption. Now, Absolutely. Well, you could argue that the upside of demonetization is yet to, it's, it's also a promise. It has not come yet, although the downside is very clear in the short run. So one doesn't know. Now, uh, so what other forms of disruption uh, uh, do you think, uh, uh, what do you want? I mean, no, I want regulatory disruption. I don't want uh, just, uh, you know, I mean, yes, I think the, the demonetization was a very good disruption. And I mm. think long term, we are going to benefit hugely because of, mm. you know, the digital economy taking shape. Mm. So, you know, you're almost forcing that particular agenda. Mm -hmm. But what I'm talking about is, again, why was demonetization not such a smooth rollout? Okay, because there the was part. because again there were multiple agencies and multiple ministries involved, mm -hmm. and if they had all been aligned, you would have probably seen a much smoother rollout. Mm -hmm. But this is what our problem is. That's the governance structure. That's the governance. So structure. if you want to disrupt something, yes, it it is going to be very tough. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad that demonetization has finally done what it was supposed to do mm -hmm. and now as you said maybe short term pain but for long term gain but tell me kiran this is about the central government right central government makes larger policies uh, which are then uh, those frameworks get passed down to the states Correct. and you know further down to districts panchayats etc uh, but do you think we as as a collective as a society we lack the ability to uh, think clearly on some basic issues like the way we organize ourselves, our, our urban spaces, for instance. I mean, you, you've been in the forefront of <laughs> so many campaigns in Bangalore about the way uh, Bangalore has uh, gone from, you know, bad to worse in terms of, uh, you know, environment, in terms of uh, traffic, roads, urban congestion. Uh, similarly, I see Mumbai, you know, the, some of the top industrialists, best minds <laughs> live there. But then you, sometimes you wonder whether all these minds together uh, could not give themselves, uh, uh, you know, an orderly urban space. I mean, what, what is it that, that is in some sense problematic about the way we do things? See, our governance is at loggerheads with political needs and political wants. And we, we tend to push everything uh, onto politicians. Do you think that they are responsible for everything or should we also take some part of the blame? No, I think it's about the governance structure. Mm -hmm. If you had a proper governance structure, then you don't blame anybody. Yeah. Because the system should take care You're of itself. You're talking about institutions. We need... So today, for instance, in, in, in Bangalore, you have a, a, a governance structure mm -hmm. that really does not, uh, uh, you know, allow the administrative forces to mm -hmm. take proper uh, policy decisions. Mm -hmm. Because then you have... A, you know, for instance, you don't even have an elected mayor mm -hmm. uh, for, a, for a long period of time. This yes. is kind of a, a, a figurehead uh, mayor for one year at a time, which serves no purpose. Municipal governance is a problem and all over India. And municipal governance is a problem all over India. across the country yeah. because we don't have the right governance structure. That's what I mean. Mm -hmm. So it starts with the basic governance structure. Mm -hmm. of, uh, of of our s urban societies, of any society yeah. for that matter, whether it's panchayat or, uh, you know, urban uh, municipalities or whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. I think our governance uh, system and our mm -hmm. governance structure has to be revamped. Mm -hmm. For What will it take, do you think, to for this to get revamped? Do you think there should be pressure from below? People should sort of come up and 
demand no, it, or it, throw governments out, or throw you know, it politicians is going to, out. It is, That's happening yeah, to some extent, yeah, but, yeah. but the things don't seem to change. No, it is really going to be up to political leadership to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens is it's a bit of a catch-22. Mm -hmm. uh, if 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 a political if political leadership wants to bring about change then they are worried about losing a huge part of their vote bank yeah. so then they sort of put up with and it and we have another problem of every 6 months you have state elections so the the attention of the government gets diverted to fighting the bihar elections up elections or the assam elections and uh, Yo, so i think the all, whole all kind of decisions get stalled until election so yeah so i think the notion that you should actually conduct these parallelly is is quite good you know because you shouldn't keep having to deal with uh, elections throughout a, a five year so term so you are a proponent of one time or at least on well you know you at least don't uh, you know extend it beyond a year hmm. because i think otherwise to have it across the five year period is a bit unsettling and it doesn't serve the purpose mm -hmm. So I think, uh, I mean, that, that's one part of it. But I'm really getting back to the basic governance structure. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, uh, people like probably Chandrababu Naidu has an opportunity to really, really, uh, you know, go with a very good governance structure ground up mm -hmm. because he's starting up a new state. New state, yeah. Mm -hmm. But to try and retrofit an old legacy system is very, very tough. Mm -hmm. And I know that in Bangalore we've been shouting for it, we've been fighting for it. Yeah. But it's very difficult. There was uh, one instance of Narayan Murthy and his executives themselves coming out and trying to repair the roads. <laughs> We've had those instances too. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's, I mean, we still get things done. Don't, I, I don't think that's the problem. But um, mm -hmm. I think in Bangalore, one thing is there's a huge amount of citizens' engagement. So mm -hmm. from that point of view, when we want certain things done, we actually get it done. Mm -hmm. So that is one part of the positive uh, aspects of, uh, you know, uh, the, the Bangalore uh, yeah. governance structure where citizens are able to influence government to do certain things. Okay. But on the other hand, uh, you know, this whole concept of having a, a Bangalore Metropolitan Planning Council mm -hmm. and who really should be sitting on top of the mm -hmm. uh, the municipality and, you know, strategizing and planning and getting things done and municipality should just be uh, implementing and, and executing mm -hmm. uh, what it plans for, it still hasn't happened. Still hasn't okay? happened. Yeah. So I think that governance structure has to change and until then you're not going to see any difference because today the whole planning of the town or the urban uh, mm -hmm. you know cities are so bad yeah, yeah, yeah. that you know you don't have zoning you don't have proper infrastructure planning you don't have anything so you know it, it's really in a bad shape but would this uh, would you also want to link this to uh, the big demand for uh, for change in the way politics is run in the country political funding for instance uh, people are very vocal these days about uh, one of the uh, one of the big objectives of demonetization was also uh, that political parties should start, you know, uh, they should start making their funding totally transparent, uh, maybe digital. Well, I completely agree so, about. I, but I'm but glad. that doesn't seem to be happening because no, in no, the UP elections, uh, yeah. election commissioner, chief election commission commissioner, the other day said that three times more cash was seized this time than in the 2012 UP elections. So, so some of those uh, aspects of, uh, uh, you know, demonetization, objectives of demonetization don't, don't seem to be sort of, you know, uh, coming through. Yeah, to but it, I no? think, you know, these kind of changes uh, happen, um, you know, slower than other, other kind of things. But at the same time, I'm really glad that, uh, you know, this government has brought in the concept of uh, electoral bonds. I mean, and, and that, I think, will allow political funding. Mm -hmm. I think most, and it's anonymous, so I think that will allow a lot of uh, legitimate polit political funding, okay. you know, which I think will help uh, uh, parties to overcome the kind of... Uh, but do you think there should be transparency in the sense... Uh, it's very difficult, difficult in a country like ours to be transparent. Some, yeah, you know, we still are not mature enough to accept mm -hmm. political differences, right? Differences, yeah. So I think people would like to fund parties, but they don't necessarily what do you think of the uh, the other uh, the other measure where they have reduced individual contribution by cash where the person stays anonymous uh, brought down from 20000 to 2000 because a lot of people say that 2000 will again get you know they'll split it up you know just as they would 
split up large amounts into denomination of 20,000, yeah. yeah. they'll do now 2,000. So Yeah, I think that was a, I mean, I think they need to rethink that because mm -hmm. I think you again need to be very realistic about what political funding really commands, you know. Uh, I think uh, it, it, I know that uh, you know it's 70 lakhs uh, is what is permitted for uh, MPs uh, elections yeah. by the election. But everybody knows that. But uh, everybody knows that they spend, spend multiple yeah. of crores of, of uh, funding for these elections. Mm -hmm. So I think I think we need to get realistic, and I mm -hmm. think they should not try and sort of uh, look at uh, reducing the denominations of uh, mm -hmm. of funding. I mean, I think you should be able to fund large amounts of money but if you know if it's if it's it's obviously if it's very large amounts of money then obviously it will get traced so mm -hmm. that that's going to happen mm -hmm. but then if you have these kind of bonds which are actually supposed to actually happen through a legitimate uh, legal tender i mm -hmm. mean and, and it's 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 honest money basically that is going to buy these electoral bonds then you shouldn't worry who does what mm -hmm. overall i mean one last question do you, are you satisfied with the the way the economy has progressed in the last uh, two, two and a half years, uh, do you feel that the, the growth, the, there's really the kind of growth that seven, seven and a half percent uh, as the numbers suggest, uh, is that reflected you on know, the I ground think, uh, or what's your sense? You know, what I really am concerned about, I'm not even concerned about the growth numbers, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm not bothered about the percentage of GDP growth. Okay. What really concerns me is jobs, okay? Yeah, yeah. We must create jobs. We must identify sectors. And today there's a report that the IT industry, one of the biggest job generators, is hiring 40% less I, I annually. I think this is a big mistake people like you make. Mm -hmm. The IT sector is not a big creator of jobs. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it has created less than 2 million jobs. Okay, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it's a huge job creator. Mm -hmm. But yes, it does have the potential of creating at least uh, you know, 5 or 5 million jobs over mm -hmm. the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying the bigger job creating areas, I'm telling you tourism is an area mm -hmm. where which can create a large number of jobs. The healthcare sector. Okay. Healthcare everywhere in the world is the biggest job creator. Mm -hmm. And believe me, the healthcare sector is not being supported supported for job creation. Mm -hmm. You don't even have an infrastructure status given to hospitals. Mm -hmm. Okay, We have a shortage of 2 million hospital beds and we know that the thumb rule is that for every hospital bed you create 3 jobs, mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. which means you can automatically create 6 million jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay, now who is going to create those 2 million beds? It's going to be the private sector, but private sector is not going to invest Again, the re same in, regulation, in hospital. policy, those problems. It's not, yeah. that, it's not regulation. It's about your lending terms to a hospital. You cannot treat it like a, like a you know, sort of... You say it doesn't have an industry status. Yeah, it's not like a regular industry. Yeah. You know, you, you give them a seven-year payback mm -hmm. and uh, they are not even breaking even in that time. So, you know, how... I mean, you're basically... It's a self-defeating thing. So, I think the policy needs to look at these kind of things. Mm -hmm. You know, hotels, again, hotels should be given an infrastructure status because, again, you need you know, uh, a certain quality of hotels to really boost tourism in, in, in all our heritage sites. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think someone needs to look at this because we need, although it shows up in the finance ministry's list of uh, so, uh, categories under infrastructure, but sure. in ground realities, they are not giving Yeah, it. we sure, we come back to the same problem that, which you originally started with, you know, basic policy, basic governance, uh, which includes all the stakeholders uh, in decision making. Uh, and I hope uh, the government is listening to you. Thank you very much for talking to us, uh, Kiran Vajimdasho. Thank you. It's a pleasure having you. That's all we have in this uh, edition of State of the Economy. We'll be back with you next week. Thanks for watching.